the Internet Science Network of Excellence, which is a, uh, as you can see, a, a global but particularly a European network of excellence under the Seventh Framework Program. Uh, we're an ac academic group largely. You can see the members there uh, drawn from both technical fields and also from uh, social science and humanities fields as well. Um, but uh, I'm sure that you can pick out your favorite uh, uh, partner in research or, uh, or, or dialogue from uh, the group that we have there. Uh, my name is Chris Marsden. I'm going to be co-chairing the session. I'm a professor at the University of Sussex. Uh, and my co-chair will be Maryam Mazuki. Maryam will be chairing the first panel. Um, and it's worth just giving you a quick rundown of what's going to happen. We're going to have an initial presentation uh, we, and we'll introduce the speaker in a moment. Then a panel, which will take 45 minutes up to 5 o'clock. Then a second panel, taking 45 minutes up to 5.45. And then a final presentation that will tell us uh, how we should have done the entire panel and how we should be measuring metrics for multi-stakeholderism uh, to, uh, to complete the show uh, just before 6 o'clock. So we're going to try and keep this as lively and interactive as possible. Uh, for two reasons. The first is that most of you are probably jet-lagged to hell, and so therefore we really should try and make this an animated discussion. And, and the second is because, of course, issues of substance around whether or not multi-stakeholderism really works, how we can actually measure it, are really central to the discussions that we need to be having at this IGF. Uh, given this is now 10 years past the WISIS Geneva, we've had 10 years of talking about this. Let's see if it's really actually happening, and if it is, where it's effective and where it isn't. Um, Ben, could you press the, uh, the second slide? Uh, so I just want to give you an idea of where this fits within the internet science work that we're doing. Uh, I mentioned this is work that works across uh, both uh, technical work and uh, uh, research that uh, integrates uh, social science into the research, the user experience into the research. Uh, and we sit here. This is uh, the work. It's uh, governance, regulation, and standards. Uh, and the reason we want to do this workshop here is to see if we can actually um, measure actually create metrics to actually measure the effectiveness of participation in multi-stakeholderism. I know there's a lot of cynicism about whether or not uh, this is a slogan. I think this morning the, the most retweeted tweet from the high-level meeting was actually the people who say multi-stakeholder are the people who don't believe in it. Uh, and so let's see if that's actually the case or not. Um, so I'm going to hand over to, to Miriam uh, for the first panel and uh, speak to you again at 5 o'clock. Miriam. Thank you, uh, Chris. Oh, by the way, these slides will be distributed in, the, in a minute uh, to you. So I'm Mer Mazuki. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm an academic researcher with the CNRS, the French uh, National Scientific Research Center based in, uh, in, in Paris. And it will be my pleasure to uh, moderate the first panel today. But before that, as uh, Chris mentioned, we have decided to uh, have a, a kickoff presentation. Actually, it would be very helpful uh, for uh, our discussion. And uh, our first presentation will be uh, made by uh, Alison Powell from the London School of uh, Economics. And she will be uh, presenting uh, some uh, methods on uh, mapping uh, values as a means to uh, understand um, multi stakeholder participation in internet governance debate. So please, uh, Alison, you have Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Miriam. Um, and uh, welcome to everyone here. And as I'm going to make an assumption, um, which I hope is a correct assumption, and my assumption is that the people in this room are representative of the various different perspectives on internet governance that tend to be attracted and represented more or less well at the IGF. So I, I'm going to speak to you not um, as an academic researcher, um, I'm going to speak to you as um, somebody who has for a very long time been interested in these processes of advocacy, processes of discussion, of um, different things that we think the internet means, um, different, things, different reasons we think the internet is important. And I'm actually just going to give you in five minutes um, a, a, a very straightforward assessment of a project that I did some time ago which was trying to understand what happens when all of us with our different perspectives on the internet come together and try and make decisions. Um, and the background to this is that uh, before I became a professor at the London School of Economics, I was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford. And one of the things that we did at Oxford was we hosted policy forums, um, which were like the IGF. They were places where people with different perspectives 
could come together and openly talk about policy issues. And I decided that policy forums were actually a really unique space where we could start looking at how people discuss what is important to them in internet governance. Um, and one of the policy forums we hosted was on the topic of freedom of expression versus child protection. And when we invited people to this policy forum, we got the usual responses. Okay, uh, we're going to go and have a debate about freedom of expression versus child protection, as if these two issues were completely opposed. And I and my colleague decided that maybe we should take a different approach to this, and instead of mapping these kinds of debates as oppositional debates, maybe we could map them as a kind of ecology. And we thought we could map them as a kind of ecology of values. And so instead of thinking about me versus you, my issue versus your issue, we could look at how people's um, own individual perceptions of what was valuable um, might have intersected or overlapped or shifted. Um, so this is a mapping that we did of all of the different organizations who we invited to our policy forum um, who wrote position papers for us before they came to our forum. And this is their values um, for what kinds of things they thought were important about the internet. Um, and the axes are kind of an axis between risk and responsibility, between openness and protection of content on the internet. And I'm just showing this because I wanted to show it as a way of illustrating a different kind of dynamic, not a dynamic of opposition, but a dynamic of shifting values. And the, way I, the reason I say shifting values is because in this ecology, we don't just have organizations. We also have individuals. So everybody here in this room has a kind of organizational mandate they speak for, but they also have their own individual interpretation of their, of their organization's mandate. So we are kind of in a, in a very interesting ecology in which we don't just have actors who debate. We have all kinds of people who are trying more or less well to negotiate with each other. Can I have my other slide? Um, and this is what I came up with at the end of this um, uh, experiment, which we ran for two years. We had two policy forums. They were Chatham House rules. They were closed. Uh, I solicited position papers in advance, and then we closed the door, and we had a discussion um, about child protection and freedom of information in which people got to talk about what they thought was important about these two issues. And this is what we came up with. We came up with the fact that, in fact, there are, there are sort of anchoring values that everyone shared, even people who had very different responses to how policies should be set. And one of those um, very core values was human rights, and you can see the rest of them arrayed around, the, around uh, that sort of central core. I'm going to close now because all I wanted to illustrate with this um, anecdote was that I would like you, in the rest of your discussions here, in this workshop, but also in the IGF as a whole, to think about whether this metaphor of an ecology of values um, gives you a different way of thinking about these governance debates um, from yourself as an individual, from the way your organization interacts, and also perhaps in the greater ecology um, that we are now using to try and figure out what we collectively think is the value of the internet. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Uh, unless you have uh, one or two uh, clarification uh, questions, we will uh, immediately turn to the, to the first uh, panel. Uh, Alison's uh, presentation uh, gave us uh, excellent food for tooth uh, in terms of uh, this uh, metaphor of the ecology of uh, values. But in addition to uh, mappi mapping uh, values, there have been and there could be uh, some other uh, indicators or criteria that could be defined as uh, metrics, and this is precisely what we are trying to define uh, in our uh, projects. Uh, some obvious uh, criteria could be uh, transparency, accountability, and the whole set of uh, uh, democratic uh, values and uh, principles, but we can also go uh, maybe deeper into uh, details through uh, the analysis of the different stakeholder uh, groups and their uh, composition. For instance, uh, can we uh, consider that these ideal types um, of uh, stakeholder groups represent the, the reality of the people and or people as individuals, I mean, and organizations sitting uh, at the table? Uh, 
at the internet governance table or should we consider that there could be uh, some amount of uh, porosity, I would say, between different uh, stakeholders uh, through shared values, of course, but also shared networks or uh, maybe I should say shared uh, uh, social capital. And uh, last but not least, maybe also through shared funding sources because this is very important to uh, try to, to identify what are the main sources for funding to uh, attend uh, this uh, kind of, uh, of uh, meeting. And with this uh, uh, workshop, we in the European Networks on the Internet Science, we really uh, very much would like to test uh, these different uh, ideas against your own uh, experience and first and foremost the experience of uh, our uh, panelists, this uh, experience uh, all really on the ground and uh, also we would like to hear from you on what could be the most uh, relevant uh, metrics to be used for our analysis and for the assessment of uh, multi-stakeholder uh, participation. So I don't want to be uh, very long in this uh, introduction, but we will also discuss in a second moment of uh, the, the panel some recent uh, developments, uh, especially concerned, uh, concerning the joint announcement by uh, Mrs. Dilma Rousseff, the Brazilian president, and Mr. Fadi Shiade, the ICANN president and uh, CEO, to hold an internet governance summit in, uh, in Brazil. And there are many rumors that we are hearing about how multi-stakeholder participation will be, organizing, uh, will be organized at this summit, or if there even be any real multi-stakeholder participation. So we will discuss uh, that uh, also. And and to discuss that, we have gathered uh, uh, for this first panel some uh, uh, law and uh, policy uh, maker. Uh, by law, I also mean uh, a soft law, not only hard law, hard legislation, as well as uh, some civil society uh, representatives. We were supposed to also have on our panel a private sector representative, uh, namely uh, Mrs. Erika Mann from uh, uh, Facebook, but uh, unfortunately she couldn't uh, join us. Uh, here in Bali. So uh, in our panel today we will have uh, uh, Mrs. Amelia Anders Dotter, a member of the European uh, Union Parliament and uh, probably you will indicate us uh, from which party you, you come from, that is uh, interesting. We will have also Mr. Jan Malinowski from the Council of Europe and Jan is the head of the Information Society uh, Department. Uh, we also have uh, Mrs. anne Carl Blanc from the uh, OECD. She is the head of Information Computer and Communication uh, Policy uh, Division. And as civil society representative, uh, we have Jeremy uh, Malcolm from Consumer Internationals and uh, uh, Henriette Esther Wiesen uh, from uh, the Association from Progressive uh, Communication. I would uh, directly turn to our um, uh, lawmakers, even soft lawmakers, to ask them about uh, their experience in uh, uh, multi-stakeholder inclusion in the, the process they are uh, involved in, and uh, uh, maybe they could uh, report uh, to us and uh, provide us with some uh, information so that we can derive some uh, relevant criteria for our research. Maybe I'm Maria, if you want to start. So, hello. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I come from the Pirate Party. So, we were formed in Sweden in 2006 to discuss the outstanding topics of internet governance and what this means for um, communities and societies, also in terms of, of lawmaking. And so, I think legislators do have an actual and very relevant influence over what happens also with technologies. The idea that uh, our legal framework doesn't influence society or the ways that technology develops is um, largely wrong. It is, of course, so that any industrial policy from a large economic bloc, for instance, has an incredible impact on what type of technologies can be legally deployed in a market, or what type of technologies cannot be legally deployed in a market. This makes a difference because it determines what is the legal way of making money. And so um, the absence or the presence of 
of policy making also from legislative institutions or governments have an enormous impact on, on, what, um, on, on what the technical framework we get actually is. Um, so uh, in Brussels and in the European Parliament, uh, multi-stakeholderism is sometimes mentioned, but to be perfectly honest, we live in a very um, uh, lobbied kind of bubble of, of the, the people who have the money to be represented in Brussels are represented in Brussels. Uh, we have a much stronger presence of, uh, yeah. of corporations, of course, than we have from um, um, civil society actors, even if we do have civil society organizations uh, present in Brussels full time as well. Uh, what I have heard, and this is something that I asked actually somebody from a telecommunications company in order to affirm my, my suspicion, was that 10 years ago in Brussels, or 15 years ago, you would have found more technical people from telecommunications operators being active in Brussels to ensure that the new regulations for the liberalized telecommunications markets made technical sense, whereas now the lobbying is more um, done by people with degrees in economics or law, which means that you get um, a more business-oriented um, lobbying process. Um, so. Um, that is interesting for the uh, policy development because it means that both the lobbyists and as an effect also the politicians are more making uh, decisions based on what is the business model that we want rather than what makes technical sense given the political ambitions that we have. Um, and so in some respects that actually removes some of the um, ability of the legislator to decide what is, the moral, um, what is the moral consequences of my decisions here? How do I make sure on the technical level that my moral ambitions uh, for the European Union in this case uh, come true? And it's more a question of which business model do I prefer over the other business model out of all the business models advocated to me as good by, by some corporations. Um, so that would be, I guess, my initial comment. Thank you. The, the EU has set up uh, quite recently the, what we call the lobbying registry uh, to, in view to make it more transparent. Do you, do you think this has uh, really make, made any change? I support the idea of a transparency register. I also think that there's a point in having the registration requirements low because the more expensive and the more time consuming it becomes to register in a transparency um, register, of course, also the fewer people are going to want to do it. So we keep the entrance barriers low. You can register if you want. Actually, Brussels still has a largely unregistered lobbyist population. So um, for some reason, a lot of people choose not to get registered. Um, but which also has then the additional advantage that if a company has representation in Brussels, then they can pick in experts from other parts of Europe without going through a large administrative process. So it could be um, good also. Uh, what is important though, and what's been showing especially in the last year, is that vigilance over registrations so that actually those who do get registered submit the right information because sometimes um, that does not happen. We had one lobby group which did not disclose its funding which was formed by a, a PR firm in Brussels, and actually that PR firm had only acted on the mission of a very large um, IT company in this case. And so that was discovered by a civil society organization that is also registered. Um, and so that kind of vigilance is important in, in the transparency mechanisms of the EU. Uh, thank you very much. I will turn now to Jan Malinowski. The Council of Europe uh, have been um, always one of the most inclusive uh, intergovernmental uh, organization uh, for civil society and uh, civil society representative, but we can uh, witness, and actually I witnessed my, myself since uh, I am also uh, part of this uh, uh, different uh, working group, I witnessed since uh, I would say 2005 on the topic in the domain of uh, internet governance, internet policy uh, making, uh, an increase in this uh, involvement of uh, civil society actors. So uh, could you please uh, report your experience uh, on this issue? <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> my experience, my experience is that at the beginning of a process, uh, stakeholders are very uh, are incredulous. They don't believe that the Council of Europe can be multi-stakeholder in nature. 
they think it's an alibi and they come with, with great reticence and then they, they warm up to the, to the dynamics and the, and the, uh, the work, uh, the, the methods and, and the fact that it is a multi, uh, multi uh, uh, it's a, uh, an intergovernmental organization. So <coughs> at the end of the day, the, the top decision makers, both in respect of priorities and of, the, of certain aspects of the substantive output, are governments, are our 47 uh, member states. But it is true that there is an ecology out there, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that it is of values. It may be of other things, not necessarily always of values. And I think that <coughs> the tensions that we uh, are experiencing in respect of internet governance are an expression of the fact that there are these different issues and different interests competing. <coughs> the, the internet and the governance of the internet grew and, and was set in place in a, in a spontaneous way at the beginning. The tensions uh, that are being uh, experienced now are uh, the, the result or the, the expression of, the, uh, of uh, the willingness to change the balance of powers there. And, uh, and uh, that has a set of reasons uh, behind it. Uh, there is, uh, there is uh, I guess, a significant loss of credibility in respect of who is doing what and why. Uh, <coughs> governments, uh, uh, for example, they breach uh, freedom uh, of the internet and then they exercise Orwellian type of supervision and control. Uh, the industry uh, claims neutrality and then uh, try to, to colonize spaces and make them totally not neutral. Uh, the technical community uh, have their own tensions. They, they, uh, they try to do the best for the system and then allow backdoors uh, to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the system that can make it uh, vulnerable and so on. <coughs> Civil society uh, is, is a, a force that is there to be critical, to be, to be, to be uh, uh, analytical, to, to, to observe what is happening and uh, they also acquire some uh, power and they, they push back and they, they propose even uh, in, in some way alternatives to the, to the whole system and they say we, we should create uh, another internet that is free because this one is no longer free. So <coughs> there are all these tensions there that show I think that there is, uh, there is uh, uh, a set of dysfunctions and, uh, and maybe uh, it is necessary to be clearer about uh, what we have and uh, how we are uh, uh, how we are using the multi-stakeholder model. Now, metrics. I have difficulties with that. I, I don't quite understand what we are talking about. Metrics could be the dimension or the scope. How many stakeholders? It could be the nature of the stakeholder. It could be the duration of the stakeholder, the multi-stakeholder process. We in the Council of Europe, we have been living a multi-stakeholder reality, different scope, different dimension for a, a long uh, period, for years, <coughs> in particular in the internet governance area, for eight or 10 years in respect of freedom of expression and media issues for much longer than that. But it's not, <coughs> mostly at least I think, it's not a lobby situation. It's not the sort of, uh, we, we experience uh, lobby uh, activity, but it is not a lobby uh, structure that we, that we have. It is real dialogue uh, of a multi-stakeholder nature. That's the way we, we try to, to do it. And there, another aspect of the metrics is the impact. And there, I think that, uh, what is the impact of the multi-stakeholder dialogue uh, activity and so on? In, in the Council of Europe, uh, we have been trying to identify, to construct an architecture for multi-stakeholder activity. We <coughs> have uh, dealt with a number of, uh, of topics in a multi-stakeholder fashion. The work of ISPs and human rights, for example. We've had dialogue with the ISP industry and we have uh, developed uh, a set of human rights principles and guidelines uh, for the work of ISPs. We've done the same in respect of s search engines. 
the same in respect of social networks. We have worked and we are working on uh, net neutrality. Uh, we, have, we, we are working on users' rights, on a guide for users in respect of, of their guides on the internet. We, we bring together all these stakeholders in order to discuss these things. Uh, at the end of the day, we don't really know what the impact is. We know that we have an output that is part of, uh, of the impact. We know that that output, that, that tangible document that is adopted by a group or by the Committee of Ministers uh, is there, and we know that it is referred to, it's picked up here and there and so on, but what is the real impact? It's very difficult to measure that. So, so I think that, <coughs> I'm not sure that I'm answering your question. If, if you want me to talk more about the sort of stakeholders, the arrangements that we have, I, I think that more is necessary in order to, to identify a meaningful architecture, a matrix for multi-stakeholder participation. Uh, we have not managed to do that. We have a mandate. Our Committee of Ministers tells us, you have to work in a multi-stakeholder fashion, and we do. We have to be uh, uh, called to account as well as the Council of Europe. Are we really delivering multi-stakeholder dialogue and results? Uh, if we are not, we should be uh, guided towards uh, delivering in a better way. Uh, <coughs> I'll give you one example, just one example. Uh, two years ago, the Committee of Ministers adopted two texts, which are extremely important. One is uh, a, a declaration on <coughs> internet governance principles. The other one <coughs> is a recommendation to member states on promoting and protecting the universality, integrity, and openness of the internet. The second one, the, the, the recommendation, includes a commitment by member states to do no harm to the internet. Now, that is very strong. A commitment by our 47 member states to do no harm to the internet. Between brackets, I would say that promoting backdoors and vulnerabilities on the internet uh, amounts to doing harm to the internet. So one could say that some of our member states may not be living up to their own commitments in this respect, and maybe we have to explore it. Now, why I'm giving this example, it's not because of the uh, intergovernmental dimension, but the multi-stakeholder dimension. The, the documents were worked out <coughs> through multi-stakeholder dialogue. But the objective that we set out to, to uh, achieve at the end of the day was more than that. It's not a recommendation and a declaration of principles. It's what we want is to see whether we can get the, the multi-stakeholder, the, the, the various stakeholders in the community out there to embrace this. And the, the, the core <coughs> that we make is to, to be told, to be informed by you, by the various stakeholders, what is it that we have to do in order to get these same principles, do no harm to the internet. Industry should do no harm to the, indus uh, to the internet. Um, the different stakeholders, the, the content providers, the, the, the users should do no harm to the internet. How do we get the various players to ensure that they enter the same commitment of promoting <coughs> the integrity, universality, and the openness of the internet. What is it that we have to put in place in terms of process, and what result would be expected in terms of content in order to make that something that everyone can embrace? So that would be a real uh, multi-stakeholder challenge in terms of process and content. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, the, the, all the examples that you presented are uh, soft law instruments, declarations, recommendations, etc. But uh, I think you would agree with me that for treaties, for conventions, and in particular, in this case, uh, Council of Europe co Convention, it's another story. And maybe later in the discussion, we could get back to this issue of whether 
uh, the fact that uh, we are or an organization is developing a soft law instrument could also be a code of conduct or guide or whatever uh, kind of uh, soft law instrument, whether this uh, is more likely to facilitate the inclusion of uh, a different stakeholder or whether it is an issue of uh, the domain that is uh, targeted by uh, one convention or, or the other. So I hope we will get back to this discussion later. Yes, if yeah. I can react immediately at least to part of that. <coughs> the, the Internet is an environment which is regulation averse. It, it doesn't want to be regulated. So it is... I, I'm not sure that the, uh, the, the, uh, the hard law, the treaty law response is an immediate uh, understandable response in that respect. We engage in multi-stakeholder dialogue also in respect of hard law. There is multi-stakeholder dialogue in respect of the revision of our uh, Convention 108, which is Convention uh, on uh, the Protection of Personal Data and there is multi-stakeholder dialogue there. But in respect of the rest, I would say that, yes, it is possible to engage also. <coughs> the the um, uh, instrument I mentioned earlier, the recommendation on promoting, protecting uh, the, the universality, integrity, and openness of the Internet, it could result in hard international law, a very strong commitment to uh, preserve the internet as we know it and as we want it. Uh, and it could be multi-stakeholder. It could be constructed if the other stakeholders were to want it, could be constructed as a, a, a type of in instrument, I don't know what exactly, um, that could be embraced and signed up to by other stakeholders in whatever capacity, maybe by other international organizations maybe by <coughs> industry conglomerates or uh, industry players individually. One could envisage that, but it is a discussion that has to be had in respect of what is the future uh, of multi-stakeholder regulation between inverted commas <coughs> in, in, this, in this context. If I can add another thing, another tiny thing in respect of the ecology. Uh, I <coughs> have the impression that uh, in order to be really able to understand the regulatory reality that we are living, that we are immersed in, we need to map uh, the regulatory landscape. We need to see what is being regulated, who is regulating it, for whom, and for what interests. And I think that we would be up for some surprises. We know that, we, that there are these things that are... Uh, guiding the regulatory activity uh, in an invisible way and so on. But very often we fail to know really what is it that is being pursued and, and uh, the, the mapping of the regulatory landscape would, would be very, very important. Mm. Thank you. Uh, let me turn now to, to Anne. You might remember that in the late 90s, I think, when the, there was a discussion on a multilateral agreement on uh, investment, the OECD was uh, uh, called by some civil society actors, was called the vampire because of its uh, opacity and uh, uh, the, the light, the full light uh, would uh, uh, kill it. It seems that uh, things have uh, changed a, b a bit, at least in our field, in the, the internet governance field, and now civil society, but also the technical community are fully recognized as actors. So I would like to, to ask and to report on the, the OECD experience at the ICCP uh, committee on this. Thank you, Miriam. <coughs> you caught me by surprise mentioning. <laughs> okay. Um, the OECD is 50 years old, and um, <coughs> From the beginning, it has had stakeholders, but not civil society. BIAC, the Business Industry Advisory Committee, and the Trade Union Advisory Committee were present. Civil society is something more recent, and I think the OECD as a whole um, has been engaging in um, inviting civil society more for about 10 years. But in the area of internet uh, policy, the internet economy, we have a 
a longer experience. In fact, we, we started to work with civil society some 20 years ago, started with the, the work on e-commerce, um, <clears throat> and it has improved, as Miriam said, recently, as of uh, 2008. So why did the OECD suddenly involve civil society? And I think that it's a pragmatic organization, the OECD. And internet policy is very complex. It's a complex series of areas. And it was clear that you have a better chance to have your soft law, or hard law, but we don't do much hard law in the internet area. You have a better chance to see soft law implemented if in fact you have a buy-in from different stakeholders who have been associated to developing the soft law. So that's in fact the origin of it. Um, in 2008, it was important because the presence of civil society and the internet technical community were formalized, formalized in two ways. First of all, it's enshrined in the mandate of the committee which deals with internet um, economy. And, and second, um, there is a series of principles that have been developed by civil society and the internet economy on how do they function what is their role, in fact, in that setting, which is an intergovernmental setting, uh, just like the Council of Europe. On the first point, perhaps I could just highlight that in the ICCP mandate, it, it says the committee will, as appropriate, we always have as appropriate, draw on the views and expertise of non-members, international organizations, and non-governmental stakeholders, and work with business, trade union, civil society and the uh, internet technical community within a framework of cooperation that promotes mutual understanding and participation. One of the, the concerns, that's my personal experience, that the OECD had, the committee had at the beginning of the formalization of the participation of civil society was who is representing whom in civil society. And so, we have to um, congratulate, I would say, the, the committee for civil society at the OECD because they played the game. They found a way to be as representative as possible. And Miriam could certainly give you all the details needed. But they have also accepted to um, develop and implement principles for their participation in this intergovernmental setting. The first one is self-organization. So civil society and the internet community self-organize to decide who is going to be part of that representation. The second one is an element of transparency. They have access to our documents. The third one is that they participate in all official meetings. The fourth one is that they participate in the intercession work of the committee and in ad hoc events. And the last one is about transparency where they are asked to provide, um, to make known to the public who is um, in their membership. And that's on the OECD website as much as on their own website. Now, in terms of constructive criticism, <laughs> and that's my personal uh, view there, I think that the current keywords we use for multi-stakeholderism are consultative process and cooperation. And I have two questions here to, for the audience. I don't have the, the response, but the first one is, when you talk about multi-stakeholderism, what is the weight of the different stakeholders? Are they all on an equal footing, or is there some prevalence? And you can make a comparison between IGF, for instance, and the OECD. The OECD remains an intergovernmental organization. And I have a, one example which is interesting and telling. It's the example of the Communique on Internet Policy Making Principles that was adopted at the OECD high-level meeting in 2011. Civil society decided not to join the consensus because they had a problem with, let's say, some of the elements of that communique that were in particular related to uh, enforcement of intellectual property rights. Six months later, the Council adopted a recommendation that kept the principles, but I would say 
provided the community as an illustration of what could be understood for the implementation of these principles. And civil society by then understood that there was a little change in, let's say, weight of the communique itself. And they decided to join the consensus at that time. The second issue, beyond the, the way of the respective, of the different stakeholders, is the resource issue. We know that it's very difficult for civil society to, to pay for their you know, travel, for the, for the work they have to deliver. And I have to, to say that at the OECD, in the Committee uh, on Internet uh, Economy, they are very, very useful. They make a lot of comments, and we take them on board, by the way. But most of the time, it's not always. But um, we don't have any resources as an international organization to invite them to the official meeting. Sometimes we find a way to invite them for specific events. So we can try to do better. But then I have a question for civil society. To what extent do you want to be funded by government? That's another issue. Um, and then I would say that for our civil society in OECD, um, there could be a revision of the principles for the action of multi-stakeholders in the work of the committee, and that's something that we could perhaps discuss. Is it time to revise the rules? What could we improve? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I could answer very quickly your last question. To what extent do CS want to be funded by government? We really want to be funded not by government, but by public money. This is the essence of, of democracy. It is very different. And the second point, I, I'm afraid we won't have time on, to discuss this on this panel. This, that would be for, for next panel. Uh, in intergovernmental organization, be it the OECD, the Council of Europe, or, or, the, or the UN agencies, there is uh, an interesting uh, game of uh, power, power game, uh, between the secretary of the organization and the government that, we are, uh, that are represented. And it would be very interesting to discuss uh, to which extent the other stakeholders, when they are on board, they could help the secretariat or they could help uh, the government in this uh, power game uh, around the different issues. Now let me turn to our civil society representative and um, first uh, Henriette. I would like uh, very much you to, to react to uh, what was being presented and to, to provide your own experience as a representative of APC in these processes. Um, thank you, um, Marian. Um, I'll just give a quick over overview of APC's experiences, which actually goes back quite a long way to the 90s, when the UN um, started to really consolidate processes of working with civil society. So it wasn't always multi-stakeholder, but from 1992 with the, the summit, the Earth Summit in Rio, we facilitated involvement of civil society in the preparatory process and, and then using um, internet remotely. And, and, this, and, and then I think the interesting thing about that process is that the measurement of the impact of your influence is actually simpler because it's an outside influence in process. And you submit text and then it becomes easier to see whether your text has been accepted or not. Of course, chances that they were were not always that strong. And, but then other work that we've done at regional level has been primarily in policy development. So we've worked at um, Africa-wide strategy and Latin America-wide uh, Latin America -wide strategies for um, infrastructure development, ICT um, for development. Um, and this has actually been a really open process and a very multi-stakeholder process because, of course, it requires investment and it requires um, working with business. You're not going to have a meeting about building broadband infrastructure unless you bring in <coughs> business. And that has been a much more positive uh, experience for us. And then, I, and then there's been national level. And I think there for us what has been probably the most effective um, is identifying an issue such as increasing access to infrastructure and then starting and building a multi-stakeholder process around that. And I'll reflect later on, on, on how that can relate to the ecology of values versus the ecology of interest. Um, 
And, and then we use tools such as stakeholder analysis and stakeholder mapping and policy influence mapping, you know, very classical advocacy and policy change tools. And, and that has been extremely effective because you end up working with subsets of institutions or individuals from government, civil society, business, and other groups as well, community groups, um, that have a common interest. And they might um, have different desires or different outcomes, but there is at least some common interest. Um, to jump to the, the OECD um, experience, and, and actually I want to link it a little bit to some of our other experience. Um, uh, one of the areas where we always also have had success is in more specific processes, such as spectrum management and frequency regulation, where we have, and this has been quite recent, where we've taken something very specific, such as television-wide specs, um, which currently regulators are very conservative about making available, and we've formed multi-stakeholder coalitions to get regulators to change their action to first start with experimental licensing, but then to consider secondary use license, licensing. So it's all pretty technocratic, but it's actually been really constructive and we've made gains. Now where this links to OECD is that we remember of CPAC, is that it does enable us to take that experience and then input it into the OECD process. I think that um, my answer to you, Anne, would absolutely agree with Miriam. I think the role that CPAC plays in, in, in the OECD process is multiple, and I think that's, that's uh, for me, one of the recognitions that needs to be made of multi-stakeholder processes. Different stakeholder groups don't have fixed roles or fixed contributions. I think CSAC does play a public interest uh, checklist uh, or check and balance role in the OECD, but we also provide a lot of technical expertise and subject expertise which you don't necessarily get from everyone else, or even if you do, you'll get it from, from, from us in a slightly different way. And I think it's absolutely appropriate that the, that, the, that the government institutions within the OECD process supports that, and it doesn't have to be direct government funding any specific civil society. It should be funding that's made available to facilitate a more inclusive and consultative and informed policy process. So. I think that's the answer. Just, um, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can share more experiences, particularly of one country, Kenya, um, but maybe I can do that later, where we were able to, over about a five, six year process, um, not just influence policy outcomes, but actually get people into senior positions and regulators. But of course it changes. You have regime change and everything can fall flat. I just want to, I think, end and, and by talking about well metrics and about um, the ecology of values and ecology of, of well, of interest, as, as Jan was saying. I, I think the, the problem with ecology of values is that, um, uh, or principles for that matter, is that it has a very thin layer of gloss that once you start scratch it, you know, human rights, of course, who does not believe in human rights? Um, but start scratching that surface. We work in sexual rights, for example, the rights of lesbian, gay, and trans, and other intersex communities, and the rights of sex workers to access information. You know, we, we talk with people that really believe in freedom of expression and freedom uh, um, of information, but when they hear we're dealing with sexual rights, their perception immediately changes. Um, why should sex workers have websites? They shouldn't, they shouldn't be sex workers. So, so you know, it really, uh, um, it's very problematic, I think. But where I think the ecology of value <coughs> is useful in our kind of work is it helps you understand individuals. So I think when you look at really institutional interests and how policy uh, is negotiating or law uh, negotiated or laws negotiated, you need to use the ecology of interests because that is what will prevail. But the ecology of values, um, applying that to the individual specifically in the process is a very useful tool because that is how, can, how you can effect change. And I think the thing about metrics is that um, a lot of the change that multi-stakeholder processes produces, the long-term change, is that it does, I think, uh, uh, it's behavioral change. I think it changes in our people, it changes how people think um, how 
they understand how others think and civil society business might have more respect for a role and, and, and uh, respect for one another, more understanding of one another, the same thing with governments and civil society, for example, in the OECD context. And that, I think, does um, gradually create a more wholesome and robust mm. um, environment. Yeah. Thank you. That's it's probably the main outcome of, uh, of the IGFs. Um, uh, over eight years now, even if it is not a really tangible outcome, uh, things have um, shaped differently, um, uh, I would say, over the years. Uh, speaking of things shaping differently, I would like to turn to Jeremy Malcolm, uh, uh, since uh, you, you were uh, one of the co-coordinator, former co-coordinator of the Internet Governance uh, Caucus, the Civil Society Internet Governance Caucus, where uh, the individual was uh, uh, present and could express uh, uh, his or her views or opinion at the same level or more, so to speak at the same level as a representative of big civil society organizations. And now we will see uh, that uh, new coalitions of uh, organizations are taking shape, shape at I'm thinking of the Best Bits Coalition, and you were one of the main proponents of this coalition. So are things shaping differently over the years, including uh, in civil society uh, circles, and uh, what could we learn uh, from, from this change? I think civil society has proven itself to be very adaptable, and when we're put on the spot and required to develop some mechanism to interface with a particular process, then we can knuckle down and do it. So we saw that uh, with the OECD and the formation of CSAC, and we saw it at WISIS, where there was an act actually very complex uh, um, and elaborate uh, uh, structure of civil society representation that was developed for that. Unfortunately, it's mostly fallen apart. Um, the only remaining remnant of that is the Internet Governance Caucus, and even that, some would say, is on its last legs. Um, and so, as you say, the Best Bits Coalition has uh, risen. Um, we operate a little bit differently than the caucus on the basis that the caucus, for example, has to uh, agree on everything by consensus, whereas the um, Best Bits Coalition is more of a network of, um, the, of, of partners who can come together for particular purposes, but they don't have to agree on everything. Um, so we met on day, if this is day zero, we met on day negative one and negative two of the IGF. And actually one of the things that we uh, began day negative two with was... Um, very pertinent to this discussion on developing metrics of multi-stakeholderism because um, we recognise that there are so many divergent uh, meanings of multi-stakeholderism and this point has been made before uh, many times today alone um, that multi-stakeholderism doesn't really mean anything. Um, you know, you have the OECD model where you've got different um, constituencies in defined advisory committees. You've got the IGF which is sort of like a big... Uh, everyone's around the same table and there's some attempt to balance the stakeholder groups, um, at least in workshops and so on, but there's no separation of roles between the stakeholder groups. Um, then you've got various other models, the, the ILO corporatist model where you've got the, the uh, equal number of representatives in each class. You've got the IHF, which is a bit different, where there's really no stakeholderism as such, it's just an open room, maybe not multi-stakeholder at all. So when, but it still claims to be multi-stakeholder. Um, and so in that context, really, it has become a bit meaningless. And um, we don't want to stop using the word. This is something else that was stated at the Best Bits meeting. We don't want to abandon the word, because if we abandon the word, then we just have to invent a new one, and, and that one might get captured and altered as well. So rather what we might do is come up with some standards for multi-stakeholderism. And so in that respect, the idea of developing metrics, I think, is extremely valuable. Um, and we tried to uh, begin a process, not so much with metrics, but more the values that we think multi-stakeholderism embodies at a minimum within the Best Bits network. And we haven't completed that process. We've started it and we've got some, some notes together, but we don't yet have an agreed statement of multi-stakeholderism. But I think if we did, then that could be useful in itself as a benchmark. Um, I actually come from the consumer movement. I work for Consumers International. 
And um, we work on a whole range of issues, uh, most of which I know nothing about, like food and financial services. I have no knowledge of those things. But one thing I do know about food is that we, uh, we like the idea of labelling. So you can have a quality label, and when maybe it's an organic food label, and when you see that label, you know what it means because it comes up to a certain set of agreed criteria. You don't even need to know what the criteria are. You just need to trust that when you see that, it actually means something and it's consistent. So maybe we could come up with some sort of organic food label for multi-stakeholderism where we, <laughs> where we, we, can, lay, we can affix... We can, yeah, exactly. We have the legitimate multi-stakeholderism and that can be assessed according to the best business criteria. And you can have other criteria as well. Maybe each group can have its own criteria but, and maybe a, a battle of the criteria for the best multi-stakeholderism and uh, uh, survival of the fittest. Um, so I think that's the, that would be useful as well as this metric. Certainly the metrics which can be more measurable and you've, you've mentioned some of those criteria um, and uh, I think that's a really valuable project. Um, so... Um, yeah, was there some... Um, I'll leave it there and, and maybe you can follow up. Thank you. Yeah, we are short of time, yeah. Uh, maybe I can take one or two questions. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, is there a mic? So, that's work, yeah. So, thank you for the interesting uh, the input. Uh, my name is Małgorzata Steiner, I come from Poland. Um, and uh, one thing that I was uh, looking forward to and I haven't found a lot of it is uh, the actual talk about metrics. Um, and I uh, totally admit it's a huge challenge uh, and for all of us who deal with processes on a daily basis, so we believe that processes are important and that they are the key for right outcomes, right? And I'm 100% convinced that's the case and probably um, I'm focused a lot on the process and how it's constructed and, and that's my personal uh, way of looking at things. Yeah? But for other people it is not. Uh, and now I know it is very hard to think of concrete metrics, um, but I think the real, the only probably true metrics uh, will be around the level of acceptance of decisions. And it is a hard one, yeah, because I think that, uh, what, we, what we aim for with multi-stakeholderism and with inclusive processes um, is to get people involved so that they sh can share their views with us so that uh, the des final decisions that we make uh, are uh, sort of optimal. Um, and we do that in order to achieve this goal. Uh, that is why I think we should measure around uh, the outcomes and, how and the level of acceptance of the outcomes. But of course, it's, uh, it's a risky uh, way of measuring because uh, from real life, we also know um, that people tend to attack processes uh, where they are not happy with the outcome. Mm -hmm. So we would probably have a tendency to say, uh, well, uh, yeah, you know, the process wasn't like 100% okay, but it's like really hard to make a process which is 100% okay, but the outcome is so-so, so I will not protest, yeah? But if the outcome is, is wrong, uh, for a particular stakeholder, they will put a lot of energy, a lot of money sometimes uh, to attack the process and the outcome. So mo uh, if there is uh, some particular insight on metrics, I would be happy to hear that because that's the hardest part and we have uh, very knowledgeable people here, so maybe we can get some more input on yeah. metrics. Thank you very much for your own comments. Uh, now we should uh, switch to the second panel and probably uh, we will continue actually the discussion because there is no a clear difference between lawmaking, internet policy making and technical standard making. We know that this is a really intertwined. Uh, the idea of this first for workshop for, for our project is to derive with the, the, the experience that have been uh, shared with us to derive our own metrics and then to test, uh, to test them. And also in terms of out outcomes, depending on the process, we don't have the same kind of uh, outcome, we don't have the same tangibility, I would say, I don't know if this word exists, of the outcome. So one of the, the main questions is how could we uh, use the same kind of metrics for, for, for different uh, processes. Uh, so let's continue with the second panel and please first join me to, in thanking our panelists. <laughs> 
nothing yet. <laughs> I have to give the floor to the second panel. Thank you. Thank you very Although I bellow so loud that you can probably hear me anyway. So this is the panel on the, this is as it were the technical panel. There is, as it were, a dotted line between the two because I know that, uh, for instance, Amelia has done a, a lot of work on looking at some of the processes within the W3C and how effective they are uh, in practice. Uh, and I know that Jan has a, a wonderful uh, blog post on uh, is balkanization inevitable uh, when it comes to dealing with internet governance issues. Uh, but I'm, what I'm going to do, um, we're not, I'm not actually going to introduce the panel. I'm going to get the panel to introduce themselves and just talk about the context of their relationship with multi-stakeholderism uh, or multi-stakeholderization. There's a new word for you. The process of multi-stakeholderization. Uh, before I do, I just want to explain that if you've looked at the web page, you'll have seen that there are meant to be seven panelists. Fortunately, for the sake of conversation, there are actually five. Uh, and that's because uh, Alice Manure is somewhere around here at the moment. Uh, and Fiona Alexander is around here at the moment. So they can't actually be with us. And they send their apologies. Um, of course, it's great that uh, Fiona can be with us. So it was obviously touch and go until last Thursday as to whether, obviously, USG reps would be able to be here at all. Uh, so uh, I think that we just need to start by talking about a couple of the elephants in the room. Um, and of course, the biggest elephant in terms of technical standard setting is obviously, I think, uh, the reactions to the Montevideo statement by what I've called in a recent blog post the four I's, uh, the IETF, ISOC, ICANN, and the IAB, but also the W3C and the regional registries, talking about moving towards uh, a more... Uh, multi-stakeholder model, certainly a more multinational model uh, of uh, governance. Uh, and also, of course, the reactions to that, partly through the response of the uh, Brazilian president, the call for a Rio summit next spring. Whether or not that's technical would be an issue that I think the panelists can, uh, can address. Uh, I should say Michael Niebel will join us shortly uh, to add a little frisson of excitement to the, the panel will merge and, and create. Uh, and also, I think there's another point, which is that given that our panelists are certainly experts in these issues, how shocked we are by the E-word. Um, do we think Edward Snowden told us anything that we didn't at least strongly suspect anyway? And therefore, do we really think that this is a constitutional moment for technical standard setting? Or do we really go on as before? In other words, should the IETF in Vancouver have a crisis meeting? That's not a very IETF way of, of proceeding anyway. Should the NIST give up and go home? Is this a moment anything like as dramatic as the crypto wars? Um, or are we actually getting frothy about things that perhaps we should have anticipated happening anyway? I hope that begins to provoke a little bit. I was going to use the map to sort of illustrate Moscow and Montevideo and Buenos Aires and everywhere else, but, uh, but we don't need to. We have a very multinational panel, so they'll introduce hopefully where they're from, uh, both uh, geographically as well as uh, corporately, uh, and, uh, and also their context. So I think we'll just sort of go along the line, as it were, although they're probably returning to Michael. So, Meredith, do you have a, a means of amplifying, or do you take mine? I'm, I'm going to ask everyone to try to stick to four minutes if possible. Hi, everyone. Um, geographically, I'm from New York, and corporately, I'm from Google Research. Um, I work in the open source umbrella of Google, Google Research, and within that umbrella, I work in a sort of small group um, that tries to find ways to do measurements and metrics assessment that can be empirically proven, that can be replicated, that can follow sort of scientific standards such that we are replacing uh, rhetoric with sort of empirical data. 
And I work on the much more technical side of things. So what we try to measure in a number of these programs are, you know, what are the performance of networks? What is happening on the infrastructure that can be used as sort of breadcrumbs or indicators or other litmus tests of you know, what is actually being done on the internet. What is the impact of certain routing decisions? What is the impact of you know, certain performance decisions? What is the impact of technical decisions made vis-a-vis -vis networks um, on you know, human use of the internet, on governance, on all of these other larger, softer, but in a long, you know, in a many senses more important issues. So I don't, you know, I won't be able to measure the impact of the Montevideo statement, but what this type of data can do is set a baseline to see, do things actually change on networks? Um, and I think that, that is fundamental to any of these questions. Um, it is one of the, you know, it is one of the data points that can't be ignored when thinking about you know, multi-stakeholderism, which is a really weird and vague term. And, you know, one of, <laughs> whenever I hear this sort of, you know, argument over is, should the internet be multi-stakeholder or not, it's, it seems like a strange way to approach it because it, it's sort of like a family, right? It constitutively is multi-stakeholder. There are people who run the networks. There are, you know, the regional registries that assign the address space. There are the people who create content. There are the people who consume the content. There are, govern you know, people who do the governance. There are all of these people who at this very moment are all working on those things around the world. It's, you know, we may have been sort of thrown into a room together and not really like it, but I think that's, you know, that is the situation that has emboldened a healthy, innovative internet. Um, and what I'm talking about and what I specialize in is something very specific to that, um, sort of one piece of many that can sort of begin to shed light on what's going on. Hi, I'm Tomo, uh, Tomoaki Watanabe. I'm a geographically from Tokyo, Japan. I'm, uh, I'm a researcher at a research institute uh, at a private university called Glocom. Uh, I've also been involved in Creative Commons Japan and uh, Wikipedia in uh, much earlier times. And uh, as an academic, I have been studying things like network neutrality, uh, open, uh, open data, and other issues. And uh, the, the, uh, the angle I come to this uh, issue, I'm not so much a technologist or technical standard guy as um, more of a, how do you say, uh, internet policy uh, researcher. But I have been thinking about this issue partly because Japan is very close to introducing some multi-stakeholder approach into the issue of how, how to handle or how not to handle uh, personally identifiable information. And uh, by multi-stakeholder process, they don't really know what they mean, uh, but uh, some kind of diversity is uh, assumed, uh, uh, diversity of uh, participation, and openness to participation. And so uh, my initial questions that I have been struggling with the, the recent uh, 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 months is that how to achieve uh, openness? Maybe that's not so much an issue when it, all the discussion uh, mostly happened domestically, but uh, how to achieve a balance of power or balance of influence is a big concern especially given that uh, civil society is really weak in Japan in privacy protection arena. And then also um, maybe say uh, in, in terms of copyright where I have been uh, studying and also doing some advocacy work, um, there are some corporate interests in both sides of uh, protecting rights versus using rights. But, and, and users who might be interested in more of y using the rights uh, may be able to f uh, form an alliance with some of the uh, pro-use uh, corporate interests, whereas in the privacy uh, arena, maybe there are too many uh, corporate interests uh, pushing for the usage and uh, civil society might be left alone advocating for the stronger protection, which again, is kind of a difficult uh, um, uh, structure of things, as I see. Uh, so, uh, well, maybe uh, I'll stop now, but uh, uh, I, uh, my, my interest is uh, how to achieve the balance of influence and 
And uh, uh, related to that is how to actually count different groups of stakeholders. Is technical group, uh, technical people, one group of its own? Uh, aside from, say, academics, and aside from civil society, and aside from, uh, I don't know, security companies, or are, uh, are some of those, uh, sh should they be bundled into one group? Uh, depending on that, the notion of the balance uh, uh, will inevitably change. So uh, that's the kind of uh, very technical questions that I have been thinking about. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is uh, Rafik Damak. I'm, I'm from Tunisia and also living in Japan and working there as a software engineer. Um, why I'm here is mostly because I'm involved in uh, ICANN uh, through the non-commercial uh, uh, community. So um, I think for many of you, you know how it's how much is complicated in terms of structure. We have uh, what they call the supporting organization, the advisory committee, and those they are, or how to say, like, for example, for the GNSO, which stands for the generic, uh, generic naming supporting organization. It also have a different, uh, how to say, a stakeholders within it and also constituency. So myself, I'm involved in the non-commercial stakeholder group in uh, GNSO, and um, so, my experience there is like uh, since 2009 as a counselor and um, um, it's in important because we talk about maybe stakeholderism in, uh, within ICANN about this um, bottom-up uh, consensus based at the process but in the reality is a little bit different because we have for example more and more the government um, uh, trying to get more power through the GAC, or it's the Government Advisory Committee. I, I'm, I'm sorry, there are a lot of uh, acronyms within ICANN. And um, so also the trademark uh, interest and business interest. And we, we will face more and uh, more issues because uh, the ICANN is introduced introducing the new uh, GTLD, which means we will have more new player uh, like Google, Amazon, or even uh, Dotge and so on. So how, how the GNSO will be restructured again to uh, handle, uh, to, to, uh, to be inclusive to all those um, stakeholder groups? Because there is some power struggle, you know. Um, we have the registry and registrar who, uh, who has, uh, have the contracted, contractual relation to the ICANN, and the other, the non-contracted parties. Who, which can be the commercial and the non-commercial. So we we'll have this new player. We also have a kind of hybrid uh, uh, stakeholder. Sometimes um, in, uh, for my own stakeholder groups, we receive a membership of organization. They have non-commercial and commercial uh, status, how we can handle them, how we can involve them. Uh, in the same time, uh, regarding the multi-stakeholderism multi within ICANN, we have this uh, new word the multi-equal stakeholderism, but I prefer more the, uh, how to say, rephrasing, um, uh, Orwell say there are more uh, stakeholders equal more than others. And because as a non-commercial or civil society, we are a kind of minority. We are not that, um, how to say, I'm not going to say that uh, we don't have many people who like us, but uh, they blame us that we are defending a privacy, freedom of expression, and human rights. Uh, when uh, a lot of there are a lot of uh, business interests there, so um, we also regarding this uh, this idea of multi multi equal stakeholderism, it's interesting to link with the uh, Montevideo Declaration, which is uh, it's stating that leaders uh, made decision, but how, for example, how the CEO and the president of ICANN can make and the committee organization with the, without consulting the community. So how such decision can, can commit the, uh, the community and all the stakeholder, stakeholders and constituency within uh, ICANN. So um, I, I think I'm, I'm not going to speak more, but um, I really want to, we have that discussion. And ICANN is just organization which handling really narrow 
uh, part of uh, internet just about DNS and IP addressing, but it can be an example of how uh, multi-stakeholder organization can behave in reality. We have a lot of hype about uh, being bottom-up, to be open to everybody, and so on, but the realities can be quite different. So here we are. We, and by the way, I congratulate everybody for making it to uh, you know pretty much quarter past five, dark rooms all day, hideous jet lag, you're still here. Clearly you want to hear about whether or not the five-year strategy panels for ICANN, amongst other things, are full of the usual suspects, the extent to which we can expect real changes to take place. Um, and it's not as if I'm sort of, you know, loading the question that Sebastian has to answer, but given that we've actually only just met, <laughs> we pass on to Sebastian. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Sebastian Belagamba. I'm uh, the regional director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the Internet Society. Um, I'm based out of Montevideo, which um, leads us to, to the Montevideo Declaration, obviously. But um, just one thing, Rafik. Um, not Amazon is not going to happen. I'm a Latin American, and let me tell you. Let me tell you that. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. Like yeah. But, uh, okay. I, I know that about dot Amazon, but they applied for much more. Uh, how to say TLD like dot cloud and so on. So. Okay. Thank you very much for the clarification. Um, uh, uh, there were too many questions, Chris. Uh, you oh, ask. So of of uh, course, and we have we have enough time to deal with different uh, things okay. at different moments. I will try to ping pong a, a little bit among them, but. Um, First, about multi secularism and there was a mention to the IETF in the, in, in the very beginning about if it is multi stakeholder or not. I mean, I, I, in my perspective, it's the uh, ultimate multi stakeholder organization. I mean, the, every single participant is a stakeholder in the, in the IETF. So, I mean, it couldn't be more uh, stakeholders, a multi stakeholder than, than the IETF in, 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 what sense, in one sense. So, um, that's, uh, uh, I don't know which were, I mean, which of you are aware of uh, how to participate of the, uh, of the IETF and how open the IETF processes are, because that, that's something that is really, really important to, to understand and to, and to promote. But uh, you just, uh, the IETF is basically an organization that, that does not exist. Um, you, there is no membership to the IETF. You just simple, uh, simply uh, go, use, um, Subscribe to a mailing list, and you're a participant to the IETF, and you basically you're a stakeholder of the I, uh, of the IETF in that sense. So, uh, I, I would say in some in some sense you can say that uh, it's the ultimate multi-stakeholder organization in that in, in that regard. Um, multi-stakeholderism uh, in general. Uh, before going into a, a couple of other questions, I mean, let's assume for a minute, that, uh, please grant me this, that. Um, Multi-stakeholderism means something like that a, a process is open to every interested party, even they're active or not, I mean, in, in, in the participation. But let's try to, to agree on that because otherwise, I mean, if we are going just to deny the concept of multi-stakeholderism altogether, it, it's going to be impossible to, to have any argument about or discussion about, about multi-stakeholderism. In that sense, um, I think Rafik uh, just... Uh, made another interesting point about how the processes are, are developing in different organizations. I mean, uh, I can say about the, 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 the process in the Internet Society. We, the Internet Society is uh, not necessarily a multi-stakeholder organization. The Internet Society has different stakeholders. Um, we promote the, 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 the multi-stakeholder model for policy development processes, and we reach to the point, just answering your question, to, to sign the uh, Montevideo Declaration, because we are basically a, a mission-driven organization instead of a membership-driven organization. So that's our, our main uh, uh, point. I mean, we are driven by the fact that we consider that the Internet is for everyone. I mean, and that's the fact. And um, so that's one approach to, 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 to the question there. Um, regarding specifically the uh, Montevideo Declaration, how, how many of you are aware of the Montevideo Declaration? Because we are taking this for, for, for granted, but uh, not that many. Why are you in the room if you don't know what it is? 
Yeah, I mean, half of you are not aware of the Montevideo Declaration. I mean, and some of you that raise your hand are signatories of the Montevideo Declaration. You should be aware. No, yeah. no. <laughs> they're, they're just lazy at putting their hands up. If you said put your hands up if you don't know what it is, we'd have had a, a much oh, more okay. accurate who, measure. Who does not know what the Montevideo Declaration is? Ah, those are my guys. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Um, there's... Um, Several important, I mean, the, the, the Montevideo Declaration is a short one, and, and I, in my perspective, there is a couple of important points that to, to, to highlight. I mean, um, the most important one is, is about the equal treatment of the stakeholders, I mean, for, with respect to, to, to this panel, I guess. Um, what basically the Montevideo Declaration says is that each stakeholder in the Internet governance should be treat, uh, treated equally, and there should not be any preeminence among a, any, any kind of stakeholder. It, that is including the government, and that obviously goes to the fact that the U.S. government has a predominant role in, the, in, in certain aspects of, uh, of the Internet governance. Not in the Internet governance as a whole. I, I mean, we, we consider in Internet governance to be more than ICANN. But specifically in the, in the IANA contract, there is, a, there is a preeminence of the U.S. government. And I think in my perspective, that the Montevideo statement goes directly to, to that. So it's a way, in my perspective, to enhance the, um, to equalize the, 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 the stakeholders that are involved in this multi-stakeholder multi process. Uh, there was some reference to Brazil, too, and uh, there were some things that were said about the, um, some, the, 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 the uh, President Rousseff uh, gathering of a, summit, uh, it's no longer a summit, now it's a top level event, yeah. Um, not, but hi, not high level, but top level. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, okay, high level, yeah, it could be high level, yeah, 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 or top level, whatever, I mean, but it's not longer a summit, it's an event now, I mean, the down the is, is, is changed. Um, I, I think in, when you go to multi and and this is a, as a person from the region, I mean, from, from Latin America. Brazil is a good example of multi-stakeholder governance. I mean, uh, so I, I don't know how many of you know, but uh, uh, in, I think in 1995, uh, the Brazilians created a, the um, Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. <coughs> Sorry, the CGI. And um, the CGI is a, uh, a truly stakeholder uh, organization that deals with several aspects of the internet governance in Brazil, including the uh, .vr, and they are also a national internet registry, meaning that uh, they allocate IP blocks of IP addresses to the local ISPs. And, and they have a pretty good um, multi-stakeholder organization. So the problem with these generalizations, I mean, I, uh, and I was about to, to, to go to that, and I will finish with this, is that when you say Brazil, or when you say Uruguay, or when you say Argentina, or when you say whatever country in the world, it's not that you can say that um, that it's a single position or a single or, or a single. Uh, <coughs> sorry, but I'm, I just I'm just like I just slept two hours last night. Yeah, and um, uh, but uh, uh, it's not monolithic, and you have to 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 realize that uh, that there are different aspects and different different opinions and different positions inside a, a, any country. So I just want to, to raise the issue that when you see Brazil is saying so or whoever, I mean, whichever country is saying so, you have to exercise caution because you have to pay attention to the details inside the, the internal politics. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. And, and I should say that when we come to talk about Europe, you notice that we've got a panel which is constructed of North, South America, uh, Asia, um, Arguably, we still have a tiny foothold in, in Africa through uh, Rafiq, even though Alice hasn't been able to join us, but also Europe as well. And I think the only person on this panel who's a surefire bet to be in Rio uh, is probably Michael. So, um, so, Michael, we're just doing the introduction on, uh, on the context of, uh, uh, of how we see uh, multi-stakeholderism from, from our individual perspectives. Thanks, Chris. Um, my apologies for being late. The... Um, the I'm working in the European Commission. I've been, uh, in some way or other, part of the ecosystem, internet ecosystem since 1908. I've done also uh, IPR, uh, data protection, telecom liberalization, and, and, and media. So the whole range. And um, 
I'm interested in multi-stakeholderism um, because we have been, uh, for a number of years, we have been uh, saying, okay, this is the, the best invention since sliced bread. So it's great. And all the, the, the declarations internationally, we say multi-stakeholderism, that we all support it. But then you, you, if you look deeper, you, you really, it's very different in different instances. And, and now it comes back, I am, what I'm particularly interested in is now how can this model be made really sustainable? Because if you look at it, just the fa fact that you put the label um, multi-stakeholder on something doesn't mean very much. We have to go from mantra to method. There has to be something that tells us uh, that there is we, they have always said, uh, I remember in the old days, in the first days of, of the GAC, when there were the, you had the people with the T-shirts and the people with the ties and, 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 and the people with the T-shirts were the good ones. So if you, if you, look, if you, look, at the, if you look at really the um, governments have uh, mostly some processes, procedures uh, regarding legitimacy, transparency, accountability. Now, this kind of processes and procedures are not self-understood in all instances of multi-stakeholder participation. And I think that is something that is, we have to do because otherwise the process will at some point, point in time uh, give, be an easy target for those who say uh, this is, there's, there's an Achilles heel in this. And I think we have to start very very quickly with that process. It's very difficult. I'm, I'm, I've, I've thought about it, tried to think about it, but it's because there are different groups of stakeholders and there are different mechanisms that play, and, but, but I think we have to tackle that. And, and uh, if we w want to move forward, I think that is uh, something which has to be done and it is not just like it's there because we have to realize we are in, in, a, in a different stage of, of the Internet development. And it's like, it, for a while it used to be a startup, and you, you, you could have a lot of things that worked, and, and then at, at some point in time you have a mood, something that's so important, that is so pervasive, and that is so, such a, 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 almost in the DNA of the society, and then different rules might apply, and the importance to the public sector is increasing. And to maintain the good stuff about the governance, one has to have the story um, uh, furnished in a way which is sustainable. And so one has to see also in, in this dynamic process of the biology of the Internet um, to see that we are, have moved on and that we have to respond to that and we have to get out of, sometimes out of our comfort zone and to respond to these new challenges. Okay, thank you. So uh, we actually do have some, some interaction via Twitter uh, remotely, so we, I want to ask those questions. I just want to introduce everyone to, uh, to a, another, uh, this is a proper new word rather than multi-stakeholderization, which is simply a, a way of winning a scrabble. Uh, and, and this is the word zemblanity, and I think one of the things we discovered this summer with the Snowden revelations about standards and other things uh, is actually an aspect of, of zemblanity. For those of you who don't know, it's, it's a word beginning with Z. And zemblanity is a new word invented by William Boyd. It's the opposite of serendipity. You're looking for something, and if you find something which you're not expecting, which is pleasant, that's serendipity. And if you discover something you weren't expecting, which is very unpleasant, that's zemblanity. It's a word that we need. And maybe this summer in Internet Governance, we had a great deal of zemblanity appearing all at once. So I want to ask the panel about the effect of that zemblanity on the immediate uh, prospects for Rio and other things, but Ben, you have these questions that I want to address, and of course the panelists can pick up whichever one of those questions they want to, particularly of course um, Meredith and, uh, and uh, Tomo were, and Rafik were, were extremely, and uh, I should say all our panelists were very disciplined on time, but they were particularly disciplined, uh, so I want to give them a, a good chance to answer these ones. So, uh, on metrics, can you analyze the difference between stated values at the outcome and the stated values at the end of a process, does that help you to understand the way in which the process has been shaped? Uh, or is there a division between means and ends, which means that it's, it's not helpful to have that uh, comparison? Uh, another question from uh, Malgozata Steiner. 
Uh, and the question is about the risk of trying to measure multi-stakeholderism by the acceptance of outcomes. Uh, and if you try to do that, could it lead to a tyranny of the minority? Is there another way that you can approach things rather than an acceptance of outcomes? Do you end up with a kind of lowest common denominator? Uh, and the third question, which is that, well, it's more common, which is, that, uh, which is from me, uh, Mediamocracy. It's a fabulous Twitter handle. Uh, which is that if multi-stakeholderism is only about participation, uh, then we've come uh, a good distance, but surely it must be more than that. It must be more than participation. And, and I want to add a fourth, which is a question that uh, Jan Malinowski asked uh, both on Twitter and also at the end of the panel, which was, unless we can measure the power of the influence of individual stakeholders, then all we're doing is a kind of accounting, bookkeeping exercise, simply counting who's in the room rather than the power of the influence of the in individuals in the room. And I suppose one example of that, uh, kind of a default for that, is who can be confident of getting to Rio? And does that illustrate a particular type of influence they have? In other words, yes, of course, all multi-stakeholders are equal. But to paraphrase a, a different author, uh, just because we're all equal, some multi-stakeholders are more equal than others. And how do we measure that? So feel free to pick up on any of those things. I don't know who wants to go first. It's whoever's probably nearest the microphone. So, um, uh, oh, okay. First, I, I wanted to just uh, clarify that uh, I'm with, uh, uh, working with uh, two uh, colleagues of mine. Uh, one is uh, in this room, uh, Nari Harrison. Yeah, so he's, he's right there. So what I'm speaking is not necessarily my own thoughts and my original ideas, but some are borrowed from him shamelessly and without credit. Uh, so I'm now uh, crediting him a little bit. Uh, so, uh, speaking of uh, uh, separating uh, outcomes and processes, uh, th this is one of the p points he and I disagree, uh, but uh, I think it's possible, but uh, uh, in this way, I, I think, you know, uh, relatively easy to agree upon principles are openness and the balance of power. Uh, that's why I mentioned it in my uh, introductory comment. And, and, and I, so, but right there, one of the questions I, I didn't mention initially was, um, is it enough to be open? Is it enough to be uh, open the, uh, opening the door to, uh, for anybody to participate? Or do we have to actually take some affirmative step so that uh, minority groups or uh, less resourceful groups uh, can participate? And, and I think here, um, uh, one of the meaningful uh, distinctions that I can see is whether the objectives are more of uh, value coordination uh, or, uh, or uh, technical consensus building. And I think the more technical, uh, those are of course not clear distinctions, but more technical the issue is, like uh, uh, for example, in the, uh, the network management issue, what is a reasonable network management is a very uh, a thorny question in the, the network neutrality debate, but uh, maybe a room full of technicians can have reasonable agreement with maybe some amount of disagreement, which might be uh, uh, very much uh, uh, um, better than what government would conclude if uh, government run the whole process of determining what's reasonable and not. So uh, there, there is a good, uh, uh, we, we can expect uh, some good performance uh, by relying on multi-stakeholder process. But uh, in that case, maybe we don't, it's not so important uh, to include uh, minority voices or uh, say, for example, you know, by preparing uh, uh, introductory pro, uh, materials so that uh, lay people can uh, 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 participate into the process may not be that important, but just having uh, experts from diverse perspectives and finding out where we can agree on might be enough to produce good process. Whereas if we have, we, if we need to solve uh, value conflicts, then it's very important to be inclusive, but also at the same time, maybe it's very difficult to 
uh, design the process properly because uh, ultimately we have to address the issue of balance of power, how to balance the power of different stakeholders. That means how to count different stakeholders, uh, our, our technical groups, different from civil society, different from academics, that kind of stuff. That that's, would be my initial reaction. Okay, thank you. Can I ask, uh, I want to ask you, just ask uh, Meredith before uh, we come to Rafiq. So you're aware that, that Tamas, when he gives the final presentation, is going to talk about ways of measuring influence of multi-stakeholders. Google can measure everything, including some quite scary things about me, but then I've given you that information freely. So can, can you measure the influence of individuals? Obviously, this is where we're coming into a, a real uh, quantitative versus qualitative trap uh, when it comes to trying to do that, but can we do that? I guess we can measure everything. I mean, I, I guess the premise of the question and the questions that were asked are a little bit obscure to me. Um, what do we want to achieve? What would an outcome look like? Is an outcome people using different language? You know, people are suddenly tweeting about multi-stakeholderism. What does that do, right? What decisions are made in reaction to that? How does it change my experience of the Internet or yours? Like, it's not clear to me what our sort of definition of outcomes is and how we would, you know, correlation is not causation. We're dealing with so many dynamic and dependent factors that contextually change moment by moment. Um, this sort of attempt to pin to a certain process a given outcome and then all pat ourselves on the back for having achieved it seems like the wrong direction, right? What we want to do is just make sure this thing stays afloat. And that means constant checking, constant measurement, constant reassessment, and an ability to openly admit when you know, decisions were wrong, because they will be. This is sort of, you know, let's adopt the scientific process, this sort of iterative self-correcting approach to this kind of multi-stakeholder approach. Um, so I don't know what, I, I'm not sure how to answer that question, except with sort of a reframing. Um, and I would say when we're talking about a kind of open multi-stakeholder process, I heard, I, I don't mean to pick on you, Sebastian, but sort of the IETF as the canonical example of open multi-stakeholder. And the, the, immediately I just, you know, m the, the thing that came to mind was how much money and time it takes to participate in the IETF um, and how, how limiting that makes it practically for participation, right? Um, I, I've tried. <laughs> I have, you know, and, and I know, you know, that is something that I carve out of my workday and must be recognized by people I work with or it just doesn't, um, you know, it wouldn't be possible. Um, I would also mention sort of the, the comment sort of, you know, who in this room doesn't know what the Montevideo statement is and what, you know, why would you be here? And that's totally true, but I think it also speaks to this being kind of an echo chamber. Like almost every single one of my friends have no idea what that is, um, many of them within the technical community. So, you know, figuring out what a broader scope is, what does it mean to be bringing those voices in? Like, those voices don't want to get a visa to Bali and, you know, or maybe don't, they do want to get a visa to Bali, but not to sit in here all day, right? But how do we make sure those people are represented here? How do we make sure that those views are represented? And then just figure out what is the, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis as a practice, not as an outcome, what is the impact of these processes on creating an, you know, open, useful, resourceful human internet? It, it is true, it is somewhat sad that we actually all know the declaration and actually know sort of how it was formed. But, you know, that, that's us. We, we tried to make this a slightly unusual suspects panel, but, but obviously it's not that unusual because we are a self-selected group in many ways. Uh, Rafiq, I, I know that Sebastian will need to come back on that, and, and maybe Michael as well, but why don't you take the, uh, the next go? Sure, um, Jeff. So um, I think to, to talk about the process and outcomes, uh, if take the example of the ICANN um, for the GTLD, so we, there is a clear, uh, they, they call the policy development process, what the different step that you have to, uh, to develop uh, uh, a new policy. Uh, the problem, even you have uh, open membership and working group for civil society who are usually outnumbered by other interests because they have the time, the resources, and uh, direct interests. So, Okay, we participate in there, and even when we have the outcome which is uh, based in consensus, what's happened in uh, several uh, situations that when they don't like the result, 
they go to lobby government, so you have the trademark. They, they went to lobby the government, and then the GAC at that time, they had the meetings with the board questioning them about the new GTRD program. They also go to DC to uh, lobby the Congress, and then you have the hearing of, uh, uh, and I think not at that time, the, um, some staff from the ICANN and so on. So for civil society, what we can do? So that's the problem. Uh, in such situation, we have we have other organizations. They have a lot of resources, so they can do lobbying. We don't do that. We try to stick uh, to the process, but some try to bypass that process. And even now, for the, you, you want to talk about the strategic uh, the strategic panel, this new panel, we don't know how they pick those people. What, what were the criteria to pick them? And also, it's kind of uh, uh, um, uh, discussing with several people. I, I see this as the kind of uh, the, uh, the icon is becoming. They want to become the World Economic Forum. So the kind of uh, leaders meeting, they will uh, bring up uh, to us uh, a new outcome that we will be happy to take this. But where is the community? Why we cannot participate in such a, a panel that they will set up a new strategy for the ICANN and they try maybe to uh, expand the role of ICANN on internet governance is against that the model they are stating about uh, bottom up is not bottom up. We have this with the new leadership. I understand there, there are a lot of energy, but it's not the way how we, uh, we should manage things managing things when we talk about multi-stakeholderism. We are not equal, there is a, it's a problem of resource. And to, to, I want to, to reply to Melissa about the idea. Yes, it's open, but if you are working for Google, for Cisco, for Apple, for any other uh, company, yes, you can attend and participate heavily in idea. But maybe if you are academics, yeah, yeah, what? <laughs> It's you have a specific working, I'd say, a specific standard working group, they can support you. But if you are a civil society, they want to participate, for example, about privacy. I don't think that you, uh, there is, I think, a fees to, uh, to attend ITF meeting. It's not that for free and so on. So we, we need maybe to debunk some myths about the ITF that is uh, the open and so on. It, it's good. Uh, it's a good uh, organization to make standards, but it's not uh, necessarily the best way. So maybe we shouldn't expect too much of Vancouver. Uh, Sebastian, we, uh, let me give you two minutes, then Michael will get two minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm going to be brief. I, mean, I, mean, I totally agree with what you said. I mean, and, and we are in the same boat here. I mean, we are for expanding the participation, and that's absolutely correct. In a certain way, it's a bit idealistic. That's also what, I mean, because if uh, not anyone can participate, we, we, we just don't agree that it's an open an open organization, I, I mean, it's stretching the concept a little bit. But um, uh, I would refrain. I mean, there is a lot of organizations that are working, like the Internet Society. I mean, I have to, 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 to make the, <laughs> the advertisement on, on trying to, to help that, that people that cannot participate in order to expand the participation in this, in, in this fora. But uh, it's impossible to reach them all, uh, and it's impossible. That is a little bit idealistic, I mean, to... to, to, to to expect that everyone can actually participate. There is some ways, I mean, I, I would argue some, some uh, the ITF uh, pod, uh, um, standards uh, uh, development, development process requires time, I mean, more than, more than money. And time, time is money, and I agree with that. I mean, sometimes you don't have, you don't have but, but it's only time, and it's not, it's not actual money. That, that's what I mean. I mean, you don't have to put money. If you, have, you decide what you do with your spare time, I mean, it's, you, it's there. I mean, you don't have to pay in order to, 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 to subscribe to a mailing list and participate. I mean, it's not paying. Um, oh, okay, I, I can get you back. Okay, what's more open than that? I mean, how can we do it? I mean, if I said we do an extra six hours to the people, I mean, it's... Let's try to, to be a little bit realistic, too, yeah, in that sense. I should say, by the way, one of the powers of Twitter is that when I said if you didn't know about the, Mon uh, the Montevideo statement, you shouldn't be in the room, I've now replaced um, uh, Miss Internet Indonesia as a figure of uh, derision on, the, uh, on Twitter as a result of that comment. So apologies if I offended anyone. I was trying to provoke. Um, Michael. Just very briefly, 
Uh, first, I, I welcome that we, we look for the first time at IETF because usually all the flag was on ICANN. But I think IETF is so important, and, and you're right. It, it, I mean, it's, it's really standardization is not only done for the internet, so we have different bodies. But this is really open. But Meredith is right as well. I think there, there is, a, I mean, there is, there are, there are kind of frontiers and, and borders and, and impediments. But at the same time, also, it's, it's not only about participation, it's also about to know how is the influencing going on in, within, within the ITF, because you always say, oh, it's a pure meritocracy, and, and, uh, but the very fact that you have a, have a Hawaiian T-shirt and you do humming doesn't mean that the process is always right. So I think looking at ITF is, is a good thing. The second thing is, um, on the multi-stakeholder process, what I notice is that there is a, 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 a to, to, to cite Jeanette here, is a revolving door uh, mechanism. There are very often the same people for, for many, many decades almost in the process. Now what do we learn from that? And, and thirdly, uh, Montevideo. I mean, Montevideo is, is really not so sensationally new. What has been said has been said before. Even with, in the Tunis agenda, even the commission said that. I mean, even the commission. Thank you. Of course, just as this is getting good, we're going to run out of time, but Meredith wanted to make a quick point just to... Uh... Um, just to be clear, I'm, I'm all for the IETF, and I totally agree. I just... Um, I, I think it, it showcases some of the limits of the current models, right, and the challenges to keeping, you know, a diversity of voices involved in this debate. But... I suppose there's always the, the um, democracy being the least bad way of running a society. I think there may be that consensus or rough consensus around the, the IETF. Uh, okay, I'm going to take a very quick question from Luca, but it has to be 140 characters. You know that, right? Oh, 140 character comment in that case. Ben, if you want to. And then I'll thank the panelists and uh, encourage everyone else to. Apologies, if you can tweet it, we can maybe take it at the end. We're running out of time. Sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. 140 characters. Okay, uh, two super quick uh, comments. The first one is that I would like to challenge the assumption that the ITF is the most multi-stakeholder organization. I think it's the most transparent, tra tra sorry, transparent, the, the most open, the most inclusive, but it is not the most multi-stakeholder because if you analyze the ITF, it's basically a technical community. Maybe you can share private sector and not private sector, but it's basically technical community. There, is also, there are also important biases like the fact that it's just uh, that every work is made in English, so it excludes all the stakeholders that do not uh, speak English. Second comment, uh, I don't think that we should confuse multi-stakeholderism with just uh, participatory democracy, because otherwise Switzerland is multi-stakeholderism. Uh, what we should do is uh, have a include a plurality of stakeholders, having a plurality of backgrounds, a plurality of point of views, not just a lot of people that discuss in a transparent and participatory fashion. So the, the, the point to me is to uh, manage to have different categories of stakeholders and to identify which stakeholder, which actor belong to which category of stakeholders, not just have an open and inclusive dialogue. That is basic. But to have a multi-stakeholder process, the one has also to have a plurality of stakeholders. Otherwise, okay. it's mono-stakeholder. Okay, thank you. So this is going to spill over into the, uh, the hallway outside, unless Sebastian really genuinely has a 140-character reply. No, even less than that. Uh, look, I, I was stretching the concept, and I said, I mean, I, it was just an example. I'm, it's yeah. not, I agree I, with I, you. I wanted to tease you a little bit. We, we also have a comment about uh, uh, do not track and the way in which do not track is developing. I think this can be taken into the corridor because we have ideas from that. And we, I'm sorry, we just, we're not out of time. We're about four minutes over time. So I'm going to have to invite uh, uh, us to uh, recognize the panel and thank the panel for their contributions. Uh, and I'm going to invite Tamash David uh, Barrett to speak. Tamash is from Oxford. Uh, well, he's actually originally from Hungary. He worked in Irian Jaya in Jakarta. Uh, he is now at Oxford. He is going to talk about several things, including this workshop's Dunbar number. So, thank you. So, who here has seen a a tree house in, in the New Guinea Highlands. Who has seen what it's like? 
Nobody? Well, right. So these guys up in the New Guinea Highlands, in Iri and Jaya and, and uh, 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 PNG, uh, they build these enormous big houses uh, going up to 20, uh, 30 meters. And you need a, a big group of people to be able to do this. Uh, and the problem with it is that unless you know, unless everybody can agree of who does what and when, uh, they fall down and all die. And um, one of the interesting things is that uh, we can do this. We human beings are able to build these incredibly complex uh, uh, constructions when we, when we uh, rely on the fact that we can coordinate social action together. So this is what I work on. I'm modeling this process of how we do these coordinations. And Chris said, Tomas, I've got a challenge for you. So, all right, that's exciting. Uh, the challenge is, how do you model a process in which a network of people with all the human limitations of how, you, how we do uh, uh, coordination uh, coordinate uh, the protocol of uh, 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 generating social action on a, on a network. So we, are, we have to have a double model here, uh, generating uh, a social model, a, co a social coordination model uh, that ends up with a protocol of how you do uh, coordination of social action on a, on a large group. So uh, to do this, I need to introduce you how we do this, this original modeling. Uh, do you guys know what Dunbar, Dunbar's number is? Who knows who's heard about Dunbar's number? Well, okay, a few people. So uh, this, this was uh, uh, discovered by Robin Dunbar. I, I, I work with him. Um, and his idea is that all of, the, all of us humans uh, have a limitation in terms of how many meaningful social contacts we can have. And what he found, found is that limitation is somewhere between 100 and 200 people. Uh, let's say 150. So in the popular uh, uh, science, 150 is Dunbar's number. It's much more correct to say it is somewhere between 100 and 200. Imagine that you've got a shelf of slots, a bookshelf with a lot of slots. And you need to fill these slots with human beings. And you've got, everybody's got a limited number of slots. So you've got, if you don't fill up your slots, you feel lonely. Even if you've got 100 fans, you don't get 150. Well, you know, I'm, I feel a bit lonely here. I, I go out and, and, and try uh, to have, have more friends. Uh, um, if I've got too many, I just have to drop some. In fact, if I've got, at this age, we all of us probably had the limit of our, of our number of friends, and we know that if, I, if we have a new friend, we will have to drop the old one. Uh, which is, you know, has been proven many times. So what we were doing is that we were trying to have, build a, a realistic coordination among multiple stakeholders using the idea that each participant in this process will have a limitation of how many links they can have. And then we also had another assumption that we will have one large stakeholder and a bunch of smaller stakeholders. So there's going to be some variation in the, in the influence that the different stakeholders can have. And what we found, and here's, a, here's an example graph. Can you see it? It's like a different colors. This, these are the, the red guys. Uh, they are, there's a hundred of them. So there's a very large group. And then there's a bunch of smaller groups. Unfortunately, the projector seems to put them in a very similar color. Uh, each of them with 25 members only. Yeah? So we've got five stakeholders here, one large, 100, and then four small, 25 uh, stakeholders. And what we did is that we said, all right, this is an example. Yeah? What we're going to control is how this structure is built up. Yeah? So everybody has only here only four links. Maybe you can't really see the links, but there are a lot of edges here. But each dot has only four edges. In fact, each dot has exactly four edges. So everybody's, everybody's social network is limited. Yeah? We, we have done the Dunbar's number, or in this case, the Dunbar's number is only uh, is a smaller number. Uh, and then what we did is that uh, we controlled of how many of these edges uh, are in-group in and out-group. Yeah? So there's going to be a, uh, and this here, the x-axis is going to be your openness 
to the others, that is, how many of the, of, of, of the edges are, are going to outgroup. Yeah? And then what we did is that we, these guys uh, uh, coordinated a, 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 an interaction protocol. Yeah? These were all simulations. And then we measured the, how uh, the outcoming, how efficient the outcoming protocol that came out from this coordination process on this network, how efficient that protocol was, uh, is for co- generating social action in the same group. Okay. By the same group, yeah. with, with panmictic structure. Yeah. So the idea is that Phase one is, is, uh, 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 is the, 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 the generation of, 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 uh, of how of the, the governance phase, and the phase two is an ec- economic activity phase, for which we can measure an efficiency. So efficiency is going to be on this graph, is going to be the y-axis. Yeah? And we looked at two possible scenarios. In scenario one, um, the... Uh, 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 the, the dominant st- stakeholder, so the big stakeholder, is cooperating. Yeah? So we'll take into account, we'll, we'll treat the little ones as equals, and treat into, uh, take into account uh, what the little ones' of views are in terms of the final uh, 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 protocol. In B, scenario B, we said the dominant one ignores the little ones, and it will be entirely selfish, will not move at all. So you can see here, this is the outcome of our model. In both cases, so this is the case where the dominant one is cooperating, and this is one where the dominating is, dominant one is not cooperating, is, is, do, is staying dominant. Um, and in all, both of these cases, when we go from uh, total closeness, as in you are not do, having any contact outside, and you start opening up, the efficiency goes up in both cases. But what we find is that in the case when there's a proper, if you could say, proper stake, stakeholder uh, negotiations, the efficiency goes up to a high level, whereas it starts going down again if the dominant, uh, 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 dom- if the large stakeholder is dominating, doesn't take into account the little one's uh, uh, values. So what we thought we, we did here is to build an actual model, an actual simulation of the stakeholder, uh, multi-stakeholder uh, 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 negotiations of, of uh, the network protocols and maybe use this as, uh, as an approach to testing dif- the efficiency of different scenarios. And, and the question is, al- is already, well, what does this do to Facebook and Google Plus's business model when they suddenly are horrified to discover that actually they're trying to encourage people to have unnatural numbers of relationships? It's only related to your Dunbar's number point. But no, no, you, 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 I, know that the, I know that this is important and, and does often get asked of Robin and you in the research. So um, uh, you, can't, so you, you can't have more friends, more meaningful contacts than the number of slots you have. And it's been shown many, many times. Uh, we can have hundreds and thousands of Facebook friends, but then we all know they are not friends and they are not meaningful contacts. But can I rephrase your question within that? So what, one of the questions is that we have, we all of us humans have three different types of social relationships. We have romantic relationships, mating relationships, which is, which is governed by a bunch of uh, 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 buttons, a bunch of uh, psychological cues that are together. And we have uh, kin relationships, romantic relationships, uh, 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 relationships with our relatives, with our parents and children and our sisters and brothers. And that's driven by a bunch of other buttons, which are other psychological cues. And we have friendship. Actually, we are the only animal that has friendship. Uh, very interesting. Uh, and that's driven by a, 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 a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of, of buttons as well. Now, what the Internet does... And what the digital, not only the digital, all kinds of digital communication does, it separates these buttons from each other. So what, what happens is that it, it recombines the buttons. Yeah? And this is doing something with, to the individual level 
uh, uh, relationships, and we don't know how that is, is, uh, uh, is going to affect uh, the, the group level behavior of, of these social structures. But it's going to be very interesting to see. But one thing seems to be certain is that we cannot have more meaningful uh, uh, relationships than our personal number of slots. And there's a lot of evidence for that. Yeah, which is great. Uh, I love the evidence about the fact that primate, primates have a lower Dunbar number and dolphins have a lower Dunbar number and orcas and so on. But that's slightly off the point. What we're doing here, of course, is trying to model in an effort to actually discover that, that big question that Jan asked about can we actually measure the influence of or the power of the influence of, of the large stakeholders vis-à-vis -vis the rest. And to some extent, we, we hope to be able to merge together some of the quantitative and qualitative analyses that we have within our network, but also that we know from people within the network of networks, in order to be able to hopefully uh, uh, arrive at uh, uh, some meaningful, at least research questions, hopefully perhaps some answers as well, uh, over the next year. So we, we invite you to share... Uh, some of that with us. I should say that the website for the project is uh, uh, EINS, um, which of course can be confused with, with uh, the most common word probably used in the German language, but nevertheless. Um, so if you go to EINS, you'll, uh, you'll discover us. Uh, you can also go to internet-science.eu. Uh, 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 um, I want to thank Miriam for, for helping us to, to, to chair the, the, the workshop. Um, we wanted to have a very, very short wrap-up sort of 90 seconds to two minutes. I don't know if Miriam wants to say anything, but I just want to say that I think that we found um, a lot of common ground amongst people, but also a lot of elements where people are very unsure about the outcomes, not just in terms of, of Rio, but also whether or not uh, one thing that started trending or trending within this uh, small group of, uh, 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 of people within the IGF was Michael's point about moving multi-stakeholderism from a mantra to something which can be measured. And I think this is something which is a real uh, a useful takeaway for us from this. Um, Alison also referred to it as a kind of magical word these days that people use it instead of actually looking at the process. So that's what we want to do. Um, and we thank you for participating by uh, Twitter and other things. Uh, we look forward to your contributions. I know that lots of the panelists as well as other people in the room are blogging a lot about these ideas at, a, at more depth than we've been able to cover in two hours. But uh, thank you to everybody for making it to six o'clock on the first day, day minus one of, uh, of the IGF. And thank you particularly to our panelists and to, uh, and to Ben, who ran the remote moderation of the event. And uh, now I think it's time to work off jet lag in the uh, liquid or other methods that people think are appropriate. So thank you.